Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent, which means this is the fourth and final message in my series on the wonder of Christmas. We began by talking about the wonder of the star and how the wise men were able to recognize through that sign that God was still active and present in their world. We talked about the wonder of Jesus' name and how his name means literally God saves and through Jesus that is indeed what God does. Last week we talked about the wonder of the manger and how in such a humble circumstance God showed us that he was for all of us. Today, we're going to talk about the wonder of a promise. A promise made more than 500 years before the promise was fulfilled. For God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and described that God was going to do something, and when God did it, it would profoundly change everything about our world. So let us read this promise found in the book of Isaiah, reading from the 7th chapter, verse 14, and the 9th chapter, verses 2 and 6 and 7. Hear now these words. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and the peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? O Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. That we may understand that the promise made then is still for us now. And may we pause and wonder in your promise. Amen. So how many of you have ever made a promise? It's easy to make promises, isn't it? I mean, they they almost just pour out of our mouths before we even realize that we're doing it. And, And we can promise all kinds of things. So how easy is it to keep a promise made? That's a little bit harder. We can make them easily, but we can break them easily, and it's always a struggle to deal with promises. And and just as in the last three Sundays, I've had a Warner Brothers short to describe what's going on, here's one to talk about promises. Take a look. I wouldn't do that if I were you. If I were you, I'd put him aback. It can only lead to self-destruction. If you really want to beat this, look us up. We can help you. Fellow members, from now on, my motto is, birds is strictly for the birds. I gotta stop myself. 
there. Now I won't be able to get the bird. Oh, Mr. Pudgy Cat, don't you like me anymore? I, I think... I think... Delicious! I'm sorry I had to do that. I was afraid you might be weakening. Yes, I did weaken. Thanks a lot. After all, I am a pussy cat. <laughs> oh, come now. There's no need for this demonstration. Birds and cats can live together with brotherly love. Watch. Come here, little bird. Here, you see? I really love birds. Mm. So what do you think? Sylvester made a promise from now on, birds is strictly for the birds, but then he couldn't hang on. And of course his friend, we don't know what the other cat's name is, but he tries to help Sylvester until suddenly he realizes that he wants Tweety Bird for himself, and so now they're scrambling with each other, dealing with the broken promise of leaving birds alone. Now, I'll be honest with you, just kind of as an aside, I don't think the world would be suffering much if Tweety suddenly was not around anymore. I know, I heard the groans. You see, Tweety has this attitude. Sylvester is trying so hard to live into this promise, and what does Tweety do? He says, don't you like me anymore? Tweety is always agging Sylvester along. And to me, that's the biggest difference between the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote's never getting the Roadrunner and Sylvester never getting Tweety. Sometimes I just want him to get Tweety. But that's not the point of this message. Let me get back to, to where we're going. Why, why show this silly cartoon about promises? Because it illustrates for us the truth that Promises are best made and can only be kept in relationship. The reason that Sylvester was struggling to keep his promise was because he was trying to do it alone. And when we try to keep our promises all by ourselves, that's when we tend to make promises that we cannot keep. And our lives are only as good as the relationships we foster will let them be. Our marriages can only be as strong, our churches can only be as strong as what we do collectively together, encouraging one another and relying on God because God is the source for being able to keep any promise. God is the originator of promises made and promises kept. And God made a promise through Isaiah to tell us that God would be with us. Now, the ancient Israelites, their relationship with God wasn't that way. They, they understood God as being God above us. And when we think about God and all of the omnis of God, God's omnipotence, meaning that God has all power, and we know we don't have all power. We feel powerless. And so there is the distinction between God and us, and God is definitely above. Or omniscient, God is all-knowing, and I can guarantee you that we are not all-knowing. And the Israelites certainly didn't think of themselves as all-knowing. And God is omnipresent, meaning that there's nowhere that you can go that God hasn't already been. And I can't do that. I cannot be in two places at once as much as I want to try. So the ancient Israelites and even us today, we often see God as being above us. Even Bette Midler sang a song that talked about God is watching us 
from a distance. Not here with us, but somewhere up above us. The ancient Israelites also understood God as being for us. That was a whole point of the covenant made with Moses on Mount Sinai was for God to be for the people and that they would be for God. And so there were the rules, the Ten Commandments and and all the other commandments and all the rituals of the sacrifices in order to be on God's good side, for God to be for them and therefore blessed to receive their land flowing with milk and honey. And a lot of people today will try to do things to try to please God, and they think that if they will just come to church and say the right prayers, that God would be like that genie, and you can rub that magic lamp, and you can ask for what you want, and God will bless you with it. So we have this idea of God for us. But what's the opposite of God being for us? Against. God against us, and the Israelites certainly knew that experience too because with those same commandments and covenant, when the people broke the covenant, God said there will be punishment. You will lose your land and things will not go well for you. That's why Moses said you have the choice to choose life or to choose death, blessings or curses, and so they knew God against them. And for us, a lot of times, we will feel like God might be against us because we have all these things happening around us, either to people that we love and care about or even to ourselves. And and we'll even question, God, why did this happen? Where are you? Why are you against me? And that's how they experienced God, above or for or against. But the promise that God made was to be with us. Wow, to be with us. And in the fullness of time, God filled that promise through the birth of Jesus, who we will celebrate tomorrow night. And Jesus came, born of the virgin, fully divine and fully human, and through Jesus, that chasm between us and God above is erased. And through Jesus, that experience of God being for or God being against is mitigated, and it becomes God with us. And Jesus practiced being with people throughout his time in ministry. He was with the outcast. He was with the downtrodden. He was with those who were dealing with disease and blindness and death. And Jesus brought them healing. Jesus brought them forgiveness. Jesus was with them. Now, the Pharisees, they didn't like that so much because the Pharisees wanted to be above They looked down their noses at people and they got mad at Jesus and said, what are you doing eating with sinners and tax collectors? How dare you? But Jesus said, I am with you. And he invited people to be with him. He said, come, follow me. He said, come to me, all of you who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Jesus was with them. And my friends, I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus is with you. Here's what it says in the book. You are not alone. Jesus knows how you feel when your friends desert you because his friends deserted him. He knows what it's like for your enemies to mock you because his enemies mocked him. He knows what it's like when a loved one betrays you for he was betrayed. He knows the pain of crying beside a loved one's grave when death has torn a chasm in your heart and you feel like you're falling in because he lost people that he loved. Jesus knows what it's like to be tempted. He was tempted. 
He knows what it's like to struggle to do the Father's will because he struggled even to the point of sweating blood. He knows what it's like to suffer because he was bruised in body and in spirit. He even knows how hot is the breath and how cold are the fingers of death when the final hour comes. That is the wonder of Christmas. The coming of God into our world in Jesus Christ as both the Lord of creation and Emmanuel. God with us. You and I, we, we exist by fact. We know we're here this morning because we can look around, we can see each other, we can feel what the temperature is in the room, and if those of you are complaining about it being warm, think about the alternative. You could be freezing right now. Just go outside. We exist in the facts of who and where and what we are, and you tell me today is December the 23rd, 2018, and if I try to convince you that it's really December the 21st, because I need another two days to get ready for Christmas, the facts are against me. We exist by fact, but we live by promise. We thrive in the promise of God being with us. Us. And if God is with us, we then become the body of Christ and we have a responsibility and a mission to be the presence of Christ into our world. We can open our doors for Christmas Eve, but people are not going to come thronging in to be with us unless we first go out to be with them. So how do we do that? Well, number one, we have to understand where they are. Just like that little boy who wanted Santa Claus to take his mommy off drugs. To know that there are things that are happening in our world that we need to go out and try to understand and be a part of that. To not ignore it, to not bury our heads in the sand, to not look at it with disdain and with disgust and to say, oh, I will never ever touch anything like that. We need to understand where they are. Number two, we need to remember our own stories and recognize that where we are now is not where we were then but that God being with us has changed us and made us better people. As Wesleyan United Methodist Christians, we claim we are going on toward perfection. I'm not there yet, but I do recognize that God has worked in me. Almost ashamed to tell you this story. But there was a time that I could easily boil over. I had no patience, and I could explode physically when I didn't see things happening that I wanted to have happen. Back 27-ish years ago, our oldest daughter, Rachel, was two to three years old, going through potty training. Now, potty training is that time when the child begins to recognize their own body's functions and to know that they can control it to an extent and that if they do things right, they don't have to have wet bottoms anymore. And as the parent, my job is to be that ever reassuring, calm, non-anxious presence to allow my child to learn how to listen to her own body. I'm the parent. She's the child. It's my job to be patient. It's my job to be considerate. And I wasn't. On this particular day, potty training wasn't a calm, nurturing experience. It was a power struggle. And I can guarantee you that she peed in her pants on purpose. And it made me mad. 
And I exploded. I lifted up my foot and I kicked the wall, intending to make a sound to scare her, to let her know I was serious. Well, I made a sound all right. A sound of crunching a hole through the wall. I blew it. Literally. I blew a hole in the wall because I could not contain my own anger and my own aggression, and God worked on that. Now, I didn't know how to repair drywall back then. And so for months, every time I walked down the hall next to that bathroom, I was reminded of the time that I failed to be patient and nurturing. But I have not kicked a hole in the wall in the 27, 28 years since then. So I know that God has done something in me. And Tina was really glad to know that she's not going to have to go around and repair walls behind me. (laughs) But I remember where I used to be and now I can help others that aren't as patient to help them in their own lives which is the third thing we have to do, is we have to listen to the stories of others, to hear where they're coming from, because it's only by listening first that we earn the privilege of being able to share with them and help them to get out of their stuck places and into God's places, to help them to realize that God is not over them, God is not against them, God is with them. And my friends, that is the promise and the wonder of Christmas. That Jesus does not come to stand in judgment over you, does not come to condemn you or to ridicule you. Jesus comes to be with you. I love how the book says this. Christmas is more than a story of what once happened. It is a wondrous invitation to experience the reality and the power of God ourselves. It is the assurance that no matter how far we have strayed, how low we have fallen, how deeply we've been hurt, or how others may see us, God has come. Not to judge us or condemn us, but to be with us. Will you open your heart and let Jesus be with you? Will you be a voice for Christ and be with others to experience the reality, the power, and the wonder of Christmas? Because once you believe anything, anything is possible. Amen. In the last service, we welcomed into official membership of Mount Moriah Church, Linda Gonzalez. Hopefully, you will get a chance to know Linda. If you come early enough for the 11 o'clock, you might see her as she's leaving the 945. She comes to us. I've known her for years because she was part of the Chevy United Methodist Church while I was the pastor there. And when she came in to fill out her information, Charlotte Bailey asked her, says, well, why are you coming to Mount Moriah? And she says, well, because that's where Pastor Kerry is. <laughs> well, before I could start feeling too good about myself from that, she said, well, how come you haven't come sooner? She says, well, I had to wait till I lived on this side. I'm not going to drive all the way across town. <laughs> So my friends, know this, that God is always with us to elevate us and to humble us, but mostly to be with us. Caring, real caring, is always costly. That's what we see in Jesus. It took more than a baby in a manger to save a race of sinners. It took a Savior on a cross. No life is saved and no story is redeemed unless someone cares enough to be willing to go to a cross. How far are we willing to go to be the presence of Christ with others? May you go forth in the power and in the courage to be with for Jesus. Amen.